Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. John Jones Fight Week is upon us. What's going on, folks? Welcome back to another episode of the Bloody Water Podcast. UFC 285 has quickly, quickly approached the largest card of the year in terms of stakes, magnitude, the whole entire nine. Valentina Shevchenko is looking to defend her belt for the eighth time against Alexa Grosso. That's got to be a record or something like that. Shavka Rachmanov, the dark horse over there in the welterweight division, is looking to make a name on Jeff Neal. But what's more important to really talk about? We got John Jones back in action. It's been years. Bo Nickel over here, possibly the uh, future of the UFC. I mean, listen, we got a lot here to talk about. And, you know, I can't even break this down unless I got my co-host with me. So let's bring him in. We're talking about the New Mexico native, the Santa Fe bomber himself. AJ, brother, what's cracking, man? This is the biggest card of the year. How hyped are you? Derek, it is a massive card. It's not only a massive main card, it's a massive prelim card. Derek, it's a, it's so many fight weeks, it's hard to explain. We got Shed, we got the bullet, we got uh, Rachmanov coming in, a dark horse is going to be seen. And Jer- uh, Derek, like you said, man, it's John Jones fight week. No, we're not hitting up gas stations. No, we're not hitting up back alleys for deals. No, we're <laughs> not even going drinking and driving like uh, some of New Mexico likes to do. <laughs> but we are watching a lot of John Jones fights, and it has been an exciting week man i can't tell you how many people are just excited to hear the name john jones back again man it's a lot of fun derek how are you feeling about it? i'm feeling fantastic i'm also feeling a little old here and here's the reason why man though the reason why is because you've seen a very clear shift recently in the trajectory of the ufc you john jones said it himself he was like the ufc when i came back man it's just it just feels different like they took it up a notch right so what comes with that a lot of people who got into the ufc got into mma during covid right so those people, clearly, they didn't get to live through the John Jones wrath, the the, the terror and domination that was John Jones, the, the gas station pills that you're referring to. Like, they didn't get to live through all of that. They didn't get to see through all of that. So the point that I'm bringing up here, man, is I truly feel this is a new generation versus an older generation, oftentimes an MMA who wins, the new generation. But... I think we might have ourselves a, a uh, anomaly on deck. So, folks, we're not going to take up too much of your time doing this stuff. I do want to say apologies. Last week, we did not get an episode out due to technical difficulties. Can't control that the internet doesn't work sometimes. You know what I mean? But if anything, we'll call it a sacrifice to the MMA gods. Take away Ryan Spann and Nikita Krylov. Give us John Jones and Cyril Gaon, baby. Let's go. So, 16, 12, and 2 on the board for us. It's been a decent year so far but you know we got our work cut out for us so let's get straight to it brother all right folks this is the ufc 285 bet sheet this is your opportunity to take a very brief screenshot if you are watching now if you are listening of course we're about to break it down in full detail in just one second but i think the main thing that we need to be taking away here aj is that we generally kind of got a couple of uh bloody water podcast consensus picks and i want to run down them really quickly instead of going play by play one by one like we've been doing last couple weeks i'm gonna make it clear cut simple man john jones over cyril gone what makes you think that the heavyweight john jones who has not fought in a plethora of years is just going to come back and spark zero gun. I don't know about spark him, Derek, but I think he might give him the hardest fight we've seen, and it's uh, the, one of the GOAT. How can you bet against him? Can, can you bet against him? It's hard to say. I mean, it's like betting against Mayweather in his prime, right? So it's, it's a little difficult to do it. But then again, it's 35-year-old John Jones. We're going to talk about that. The bullet to Valentina Shevchenko gets Alexa Grosso, who's a very, very talented Mexican fighter, fantastic boxing, fantastic stand-up, and even a little bit of grappling. But we're not thinking that she's going to be much of a challenge for the bullet to Valentina Shevchenko. Why is that? Another one where, yeah, it's just hard to bet against when she has such the record as she does, Derek. It's a bend against a house, man. You're going to lose that money. And I think that this is an interesting point of her career because I don't think she's faced this much skepticism in her career. Um recently at least man one close fight with tyler santos all of a sudden they're like anybody and everybody could beat valentina come on bro y'all tripping all right man last consensus pick and i think it's pretty easy why we're picking this one bo nickel over jamie pickett right jamie pickett has very much been a uh he's been a formidable opponent but you know just hasn't gotten the results that he has been looking for in the cage here's the biggest thing man we like bo nickel here um he's a minus 1600 favorite against jamie pickett uh why why do we like bo nickel why are we so confident Man, everybody's buying into the hype. Hopefully, it's not another UFC uh, storyline. Mm-hmm. We'll see, though, man. The proof is going to be in the pudding on Saturday night. 
There we go. And then you got the, just the highest level wrestler, of course, against a dude who's, you know, pretty good overall. But, you know, this guy's running through people. With that being said, folks, one more time for those who are listening. I mean, those were the Bloody Water Podcast consensus picks. We're not going to break them down, but we have a very interesting matchup between Jeff Neal and Shopkot Rachmanov. AJ, you know I was high on Shopkot Rachmanov from the moment that you could be high on him. However, I like Jeff Neal here. Why you like uh, Shopkot? Just like one sentence. This is a massive time, Derek, and I feel like the momentum's on Rachmanov's side. There we go. And then, short notice, but it might not be a problem, Matos Gamrot. We're talking about the gamers coming in against the tarantula Jalen Turner. An indomitable force meets a immovable object, so one would say. I don't know. But uh, you like Jalen Turner here, man. I like the gamer, even on short notice. Why do you like Turner? This is one of the ones I've been going back and forth, Derek. I like that reach and I like the hands he has, man. That's right. I like it too. I will tell you, if Gamrock can put up the performance he did against uh, really the best of the best, man, the Armin Sarukians of the world, right? Like really showing off that grappling pedigree. I think it might be too much for Jalen Turner. Either way, we'll talk about it all in one second. Folks, as it stands right now, 514 subscribers on the board. Let's get that up to 550, 600, and then to 1,000. You know what time it is, AJ. AJ, actually, this is your favorite fighter's favorite fight show, man. Why do they need to subscribe? Give them to them. One, one, two sentences. Woo, one to two sentences, Derek, because we're winning you money and we love doing it. Nobody else has a show like this because they don't know what they're talking about. They haven't grown up in the nitty gritty in the streets, actually, you know, rising up with the rest of the fighters in this. They're over there talking pillow talk, talking on couch games and stuff like that, man. We're actually doing this in the streets with you folks, and that's why we're winning you cash every single week. And holding each other accountable. Let's not forget, um, one of the biggest programs right there's a there's a, a pretty big face uh that's no longer with us i would say in the in the mainstream something greek right yeah uh, yeah you know what i'm talking about all right man let's get to it main card here's to another main card breakdown courtesy of your hosts derek g and aj aj how could you be more excited for a fight than this you can't be more excited for a fight you got johnny bones jones versus cyril Gan, and you got really the tale of two narratives here on one narrative cyril Gan is a heavyweight that john jones has never seen before this is a new era he hasn't fought the hybrid guy so they say right and also let's not forget john jones first fight at heavyweight who's to say what he was doing at 205 is going to be translatable applicable to a serial gone who fights outside of the pocket 90 percent of the time until he just does enough to explode get in and then knock you out or put you down submit you heel hook you whatever the case may be man how high are you on john jones returning to peak form as opposed to maybe something else that we're just not accustomed to seeing that's the question, Derek. Peak form versus this somewhat gooey John Jones, if you will. I mean, he even said it himself. He usually judges his character or how ready he is by the shape of he is in you know his form. But now he's kind of walking around a little bit of a tummy. He's he's really you can see the old John Jones is hungry, mm -hmm. but he's still shocked, man. You can see a little bit of this new stuff. There's a lot of talk going around where he's you know always in pools. He's recovering. He had a short flight. All this X, Y, and Z about John Jones. What he's going to do in the cage. But as history has shown, I mean, this dude can do anything. The youngest UFC champion in the world beats everybody at their own game. Basically undefeated, except, you know, the rules have to come in for that 12 to 6. So Matt Hamill has one on him. But as a lot of people like to think, John Jones is undefeated, man. And it's one of the one of the few people where he can do anything at any point, even if he hasn't done it before. He can still pull it and, and make moves happen when we haven't seen him do. Now, going against Cyril Gaon, Derek, the one thing that worries me is Cyril Gaon's a world-class kickboxer. And if we remember the, the past that John Jones has, his last couple fights, he really highly relied on his striking. Mm -hmm. Didn't really do too much wrestling. He, he did, did when he needed to. You know, he got hurt in the Gustafson, dependent on his wrestling. Gustafson's not the best wrestler. Now, will he be able to do that against Cyril Gaon, or do you think the wrestling's gone? Do you think, you think maybe John Jones has lost the wrestling a little bit, lost that strength, now that he's wrestling big boys, he's going to have an even harder time wrestling, or are we going to see a classic Jones here? What do you think? Well, I think it'd be a hell of a whole fight week lead up if he's been talking about nothing but wrestling and then just doesn't wrestle, right? He just, he keeps saying it. He's like, listen, man, this is MMA. Same thing Shevchenko's saying. This is MMA. This is not kickboxing. This is not just you know, a striking contest. And that's my whole point. Cyril Gaon is so excellent in staying outside of the pocket, not being hittable, and then only hitting you when you're at a point where you can't hit him back, right? So I think that like that style is going to be very interesting against John Jones, but if he can move forward, initiate clinches, his trips have been phenomenal since his first fight in the UFC. You know what I mean? Like, let's mm -hmm. not forget, in the first fight against Daniel Cormier, he took Cormier down three times. 
Daniel Cormier. I'm not talking about just Joe Schmo off the street. I'm not talking like, come on, man. We're talking about like all I'm looking through. Actually, let's take a look together really quickly, folks. For the uninitiated, those who aren't really too familiar with John Jones career. I mean, look, Dominic Reyes, he took him down twice. Uh, Anthony Smith took him down three times, took down Gustafsson um, in the one where he I think this was what? Yeah, the head kick knockout against Cormier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. no takedowns. You don't need it when you're over there just, you know, flatlining somebody with a kick. But he took down everybody, man. Ovin St. Pru, Daniel Cormier. Cormier, Glover Teixeira, Gustafsson again, Chael Sonnen. Like, need I go on? I guess that's the point. Do I even need to go on? Now, I'm worried about one thing in particular, man, because the people have tried it against him before. But one thing Cyril Gond is really good at is, once again, staying outside range, but just picking at your legs the whole fight. And you know who else did that very effectively? Tiago Santos. So what do you think John Jones is going to be able to do to mitigate that part? Because you have to be honest, that was not a large part of the MMA uh, Rolodex, whatever you want to call it, when John Jones was really doing his thing. So like, how does he battle that? Because he take out his legs, you can't wrestle no more. And especially with a a Jones who has a notoriously skinny leg frame. I mean, everybody gives him shit for for the chicken legs. And they hit hard, man. A lot of bone is in there. But it's a give and a take, right? Now, Cyril Gahn, I think the one thing that gives John a little favor here, he has the longest reach in the UFC. He has the distance. He can maintain it. And I think he has a speed advantage. We'll see because Cyril Gahn is fast and he stays bouncy. So that one's going to be tested. I'm not exactly sure if he does have the speed advantage. Mm -hmm. You want to think so, but you haven't seen him move in four years. You haven't seen how it goes. You have no idea if the old substances are still helping or not. This might be a younger or an older Jones and it's going to be interesting to see, man. That is, it worries me. What worries me about this fight most, Derek, is Cyril Gunn can just kind of rest on his laurel, stay on the bike, stay outside, let the nerves of the fight keep going for Jones, and basically, you know, stall as long as you can. And then when Jones gets a little like lackadaisical, then go in, then really start to have a Cyril Gunn kind of a fight and that kind of a kickboxing touch back and forth. I don't know if John Jones wins that fight. I, I'd imagine he does with the refs. Who knows? But the, the, of the judges, but it's interesting to think that he can at least Cyril Gon can outpace and outmaneuver John Jones. Do you agree he can do that, or it was he just going to be cutting off corners left and right? Yeah, I'm going to push back a little bit, and the reason I'm going to push back is because look at who he is just outpacing. He's kind of outpacing plotting heavyweights, right? Nobody who's forcing him to wrestle. And when Nganu forced him to wrestle, they were both tired after that, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's my whole thing is if John Jones can clinch you up, if he could take you down, make you at least bat returns, make you work to get back up to your feet, are you going to still have that same bounce? Because Cyril Gon, the thing about him that's so interesting, man, is he builds up. Like he starts off slow, but mm-hmm. it's like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna kind of feel things out, and my explosiveness and intensity is gonna keep rising while yours is diminishing. Can you do that against a John Jones? Who you can't sit here and say, "Oh, can John Jones go five rounds?" How many times has the man gone five rounds? How many title fights in a row did he? What are we talking about? But we do need to talk about AJ, the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is this right here, Cyril Gone. Pictures coming out talking about a ballooned up hand. Um, the right hand, specifically the power hand, even though he is a switch fighter. So the question is going to become, are people going to start saying, oh, this is a rigged fight, Gon's injured, this is fake, or are we going to say a rare shout out that we don't do much these days here, AJ, but there's a guy that we do respect highly on this program. Would you like to take away? What are the findings? Woo, Dr. Brian Shooter, shout out to you, man, because not only was he uh, with the quickness of this, man, right when Twitter hit, you made a video within the hour breaking yeah. exactly down what this is. And it's not only, yeah, sure, it was a previous injury, but uh, Cyril Gaon went on the MMA hour, went on everywhere and was talking about in his last fight, he had to have surgery. This is mm-hmm. what that is. So it's not even not even a worrisome, man, especially at this point, you know, he's been cracking things, you know, he's been hitting the pads. That right there is more so of a plate or it could be pins could be something that's actually helping out so don't don't take in the fact of the the narrative that is out there that this could be a uh, you know somewhat of a fix or something a little a little more tricky out there and it's like dc was saying don't take into the uh, account the fact that cyril gone doesn't train only when he's in uh, or he only trains when he's in fight camps it's not true cyril gone's coming into game there's a reason he's bon gamin man this dude is gaming out there he will be ready for the fight don't fall for the narrative 
That's right. I think this, is, it's all, this whole thing has been a buildup. It's been back and forth stories, imagination. But when you break it down to its essence, man, yeah, they, uh, Brian Tudor was more or less saying that this isn't something that should be a massive concern. This isn't something that he envisions hindering Gon's performance. And as long as we can go and get a, Han, a Gon that's as close to 100%, nobody's 100% when they get in the cage, right? You get as close as possible. We're going to have a good fight, man. I think it'll start off slow, but now let's talk about predictions. When in your life have you ever seen John Jones as a minus 165 favorite? Like if you're a John Jones better here, you're like, oh my God, I will smash this all day long. What are we talking about? So my question to you is, do you think the odds are fair? And then let's give our picks, brother. What do you think? I, yeah, I think, well, one, I think the odds are fair, but I also think you should jump on this because when the casual fans really start placing their bets, that favorite's going to swell. I'm mm-hmm. surprised it's not like a minus 200, minus 300, somewhere in there because those will go. Um, I'm a little interested to see how these decisions or these uh, props work out. That plus 650 seems a little juicy to me, just mm-hmm. being, well, maybe not submission. I don't know. I, I was thinking because we're going to see him on the ground. Mm-hmm. Now, are you going to be able to finish Cyril Gaon on the ground? That's a little more likely than a stand-up KO. I don't know. Do you see the submission happening, Derek, that plus 650? Do you see any value there? I see value in every single prop on here, brother, because I see different scenarios where I'm like, I can envision a decision, right? Just like a John Jones who hasn't been in the cage in a while. You know, we take it to a decision. He still has a, a, a solid performance and gets the dub. That's all you could ask for. But then again, he's also trying to make a statement. So my, I have two big questions. The number one is if he takes Gaon down, can Gaon get back up? Couldn't really do it against Nganu. He opted to go for hill hooks instead of just trying to get back to his feet. Can he get back up against John Jones? John Jones has submitted some of the best fighters in the world, championship level fighters, and he submitted them with ease. Can he submit Gon? Yes. Can he knock out Gon, especially if he gets him to the ground with a ground and pound? Yes, absolutely. What are we talking about here? Um, don't, I mean, come on, elbows, spinning back elbows, all that stuff, man. So it's going to be a question of can John Jones or can Cyril Gon get back up if John Jones takes him down? Number two question is how will Cyril Gon's calf kick affect John Jones? And number three, can John Jones land the oblique kick with success against Cyril Gon? All of these lead to different props. I'm going to go straight with my heart right here, and I say John Jones gets it done via TKO. I envision a ground and pound scenario where he gets him out of there, just where Gon can't. Be smart. Don't beat him at his own game. Let's take a step back from that John Jones and let's just do what you do best. I want John Jones TKO victory third round how do you see it yeah Derek I can see it I it's one of the more likely ones I'm surprised it's only 350 I'm actually going with that 650 submission Derek I think we're going to see the same thing ground and pound take it down to the ground gone gives up his back rear naked choke John Jones submission round two Round two. All right. And there you have it. So we are, I mean, it's hard, right? Because John Jones isn't ranked and you can't say and still, but he never like lost the belt. So it's like, what do you, I knew, is it and new? I guess, I guess, man. But shoot, that is, God, I'm so excited. This is going to be so fun. All right, let's go. Shevchenko, the bullet. Like I said, man, this, there's been no other time that you have really seen where Shevchenko has gotten like almost no love. Like, even though, even though, it's hard to say that, right? Minus 625, you open up as a favorite. And if you look at the odds right now, minus 800 favorite with the plus 550 comeback for Alexa Grasso, man. But you have a contender. You have somebody. You needed somebody. And the question is going to be, does the confidence of the bullet get rattled after the Santos performance? After a lot of people said, nah, you probably should have lost that fight. Where do you think Valentina Shevchenko's confidence is going up against a fighter like Alexa Grasso when you also got the Aaron Blanchfields of the world, the Tyler Santos, still trying to be like hey i still need that fight like where do you think she has confidence was it's hard to say derek because i feel like there's two sides to valentina shevchenko there's the the heel that's in there there's a competitor there's the one that's nitty and gritty the dirty the bullet you know the the savage fighter we've seen and then there's valentina the dancer the princess the one that that she wants to portray out there I'm hoping she finally turns heel, Derek. I'm hoping there's a chip on that shoulder. I'm hoping she finally gets that grit and starts talking a little shit because everybody's coming for that title. They see, Like you said in the intro, they see a chink in that armor, and now everybody can get that smoke. Everybody can beat Valentina. Everybody's now in line and nipping at those heels. I think it's time for the heel to come out and let everybody know that she still is the bullet and she mm-hmm. will hurt you. And I think that's what this fight is for. I'm, at least I'm hoping, and I hope that's a confidence in the mentality going into this one. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think it's the same, or do you think we're going to see more of the same that we've seen in the past? 
Well, I'm going to be honest, man. I don't think Valentina Shevchenko's confidence has been rattled not one bit, even with that fight. Because once again, when we talked about it before, Shevchenko actually put herself in a lot of those bad positions. Over here trying to go for takedowns that you don't really got no business trying to take them down. Beat them at their own game again. You don't need to do it. And Alexa Grosso, even though she has become a little more well-rounded as of late, that's been very, very impressive. Her bread and butter is her boxing. Well, it's kind of tough when you're going against a multiple-time, what, Muay Thai champion, just like a veteran, decorated striker like Valentina Shevchenko, who, oh, by the way, can grapple you up, put you down, crucifix you, and just ground and pound you to oblivion. Um, my, I want to ask you this, man. What are the odds here? I mean, we see what the odds are. Plus 225 for a submission victory here by Valentina Shevchenko. What do you think, though, realistically? Do you think that she can get a submission victory here against Alexa Grasso? Yeah, yeah, oh, totally. Um, is it the most likely of all those scenarios? Probably not. Definitely a ground and pound, but she, I think she can get it, especially locks up a front choke, locks up rear naked, something like that, arm barred. Valentina is skilled on the ground. I don't know, though. What do you think? Well, that's the thing. That's why I wanted to point out. I'm glad that you mentioned that so, like, without even hesitating. Because if you look at her methods of victories, eight knockouts, seven submissions, eight decisions. Like, people look at Shevchenko and they think, oh, yeah, she's just a striker. I don't understand why or where this is coming from. But when you really take a look at just kind of like the history, first off, can we put some respect on the win streak, bro? Like, can we put a little <laughs> respect on it? Like, you'd be, what, in a row, Cachoeira, uh, Joanna Champion, Jessica I, Carmouche, Chukagian, Maya, Jessica Andrade, Murphy, Tyler Santos. Like, I mean, the only thing, the only fight there that was remotely close was the Tyler Santos split decision victory. Other than that, she's smashing everybody. Now, we do have to be honest. Last submission win was 2018. That's why I ask the question. That's why I say, can she get a submission victory here? That's really not the point. The win is the point here and i need to assess what alexa grasso's best path to victory is what can she do offensively in terms of the stand-up to really just like i mean rattle chef i just i'm not seeing that path to victory even though i'm a very very i'm big on grasso i have been for a long time right but this matchup you're going against a very well round a well-rounded fighter who doesn't have a lot of holes in her game I think the only thing you can do, because like you said, Derek, a very well-rounded fighter who doesn't have a lot of holes in her game, the one hole you can exploit with any striker is in that danger zone, in that mm -hmm. mid-range. You don't want to get kicked by Valentina. She has amazing kicks. You also don't want to the end of her punches. But what Ale Alexa Grasso has is a very snappy left hook, man, a mm -hmm. very snappy check left hook. She uses it a jab as well. And that too, her jab is very, very fast. Yeah. So she's able to get on that inside in that boxing range, in that danger zone where not a lot of people like to live because you have a chance of getting knocked out she lives for the knockout against valentina it makes it a little more interesting and then you're able to bully the bullet push her up against the cage start working the dirty boxing throw some uppercuts prevent her from shooting the takedown prevent her from getting comfortable and maybe a stand a chance <laughs> that's a lot easier said than done yeah i feel like the bullet also has an answer for all of those you know what do you think Derek? does it sound like a viable strategy you see something else i think that if she could really put the pressure on shevchenko that would be the best option for her i don't think her sitting back at range trying to do that type of fight with shevchenko would be very like stylistically i don't think it'll play out well but i want to give another friendly reminder and i apologize that i have to keep going back to ufc stats but i think people forget what have you done for me lately you had one close fight all of a sudden you're a scrub well guess what shevchenko when we're talking about grappling her op opponents three takedowns against santos three against murphy uh let me see what else we got here sorry i'm gonna go down the list seven against uh andrage right five against maya three against shikagi and one against Carmouche, two jessica i brother the last time that she didn't score a takedown in a fight she lost and that was amanda nunez man come on what are we talking about here and that's and it's clear why she didn't go for a takedown against nunez right but you go back to all of her fights man i'm literally i can't go she has registered a takedown in every single fight that she has won in her entire U uh, ufc career bro and she has a lot of ufc fights here so the point that i'm making here man is i'm a big valentina shevchenko, Chev uh, shevchenko backer right here not because of the hype not because seven title defenses but stylistically tyler santos that grappling control but don't really do much with it is the best shot i think people have of defeating her right now i don't think it's in the stand-up i don't think it's in the striking but guess what this is mma and anybody can get caught 
So there's a reason why she's not a minus 1,800 favorite like Bo Nickel, right? Because Alexa Grasso got hands, and she can deliver them, man. But I just think that she has to keep this fight standing. And with that being said, I want a plus 190 TKO for Valentina Shevchenko, man. Take her to the ground. I don't know if she can grab a crucifix. I don't know if she can get that half guard position and just drop in elbows. But I, I find it very difficult to see Grasso lasting five rounds against Shevchenko. What do you think? No, I, I too also see a finish coming, Derek, and it's hard to not pick that TKO, but just based on how Valentina likes to fight her opponents. She, mm -hmm. she has gotten to the point where she likes to beat them at their own game, and if she hasn't had her confidence rock, she's going to go in there with that same game plan, so it's hard not to take that plus 190. Oh, man, I, something about that 225 submission makes a lot of sense too, Derek, and just for uh, prop literally gamble or uh hedging the prop bets man because we need a little luck yep, over here that's right i'm going with that submission man and i'm gonna go i'm actually gonna go round three i'm gonna go round three submission okay. i think it's gonna take a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah no i agree i think that's actually a safe to say i'm liking a round two or a round three i can't give a definitive number on that one it's besides the point but i will say this man i do truly believe there's a lot of these contenders in this division who would have a legitimate shot a legitimate shot at the belt if shevchenko wasn't the current champion same thing in the light heavyweight division. How many people would have been champion if John Jones wasn't the champ? You feel me? <laughs> Daniel Cormier wasn't the champ. Look what happens now. They're playing pass it all around now that they're gone. So uh, I think Grosso's time is yet to come, but I think it will come. You know what I mean? But we'll see how she does against a very, very legitimate champion right here. All right, man. Now let's get interesting. Let's talk about a little bit of contention here. My guy, Shavkat Rachmanov, gets his opportunity. He gets to fight in that legitimate top 10 against Jeff Hands of Steel Neal. And I'm not going to lie to you here, AJ. Jeff Neal is a guy that I have not always been super high on. You know what I mean? Like there was a skid where things looked a little rough and we're like, I thought, what happened to this Jeff Neal guy? You know what I mean? Like he was good. I, th I thought he was good. And the answer is... The dude is fantastic. He's a fantastic fighter, very decorated. He's beat a lot of dudes who people don't really give him credit for. And he has the balls to say, I will defend my rank against the, oh yeah, the guy that got like hype like that Hamza guy, right? He doesn't care. So that begs a, a couple questions, man. Shavkat Rachmanov, real dark horse here, man. This dude's on, let me see. I mean, I, I was going to say, let me see what his win streak is, but there's no need because he's 16 and 0. We know what the win streak is. This dude mauls everybody and he finishes everybody and his grappling is phenomenal. But when we're looking at the highest echelon of the UFC, Neil Magny, Carlston Harris, Michael Prezeris, and if you would have saw that size discrepancy, hilarious, and Cowboy Oliveira. Do any of those guys that are just named besides Neil Magny, which is a very fun, uh, impressive victory, I mean, do they even come close to Jeff Neal's, his strength of schedule? Like, I don't even think it touches that. Maybe Cowboy Oliveira, just because he's an OG and he's probably fought some absolute killers in there as well. But other than that, not really, Derek. I mean, this is the proving ground for Shavkar mm -hmm. Rachmanov. This is the fight that we're going to see. Is this dude championship ready? Or is he one of the boys that's going to be nipping at the heels? I mean, this is either a make it your number one contender fight coming up within the next two, or you're going to still have to keep building, man. Because you're right. There was a time where Jeff Neal, hands of steel Neal, was on the rise, man. This dude was on a rocket ship going. He lost a little bit of steam somewhere in that middle, man. He fell off for a couple months there, somewhere around 2022, 2023. And... Um, he hasn't really taken it over. He started to. You can see the kind of transformation. And I do think it has to do with him taking this fight, man. Having that dog in him saying, bro, I, I ain't taking, I'm not letting any of these little dudes come up and take what's mine. I'm getting back to where I am. Shavka Rachmanov is a big deal though, Derek. Do you think the, the grappling of Rachmanov right here is going to be the catalyst that gets in the win? Or are we going to see a standing battle? Because if, if I'm seeing things right, man, I feel like Jeff Neal can stop the takedowns. And we're going to see have to see what uh, Rachmanov has on the hands and feet. What do you think? I think Rachmanov is going to be relentless on the takedown. And here's the weird thing. You don't really see Rachmanov as this technical shoot in like a Mateusz Gamarai. Like he doesn't just go blast doubles and stuff like that. A lot of his takedowns come from clinch attempts. It's pushing you up against the wall and then just started working on a single, start working on something to trip you down and stuff like that. So he's very crafty and I think he's going to go to the well with it. I think he's going to have to because if he doesn't, I think Jeff Neal is going to catch him. And if his last fight was indicative of anything, it was that when he's on, when Jeff Neal is on, He's clipping you. And if you're bringing pressure to him, you're going to be in a tough spot. But this is my question to you because I think that this is going to be literally like the name of the game here. Jeff Neal cannot be on his back foot for the majority of this fight and win. He can't. 
because you saw it even in the Vicente Luque fight. Safe Saud was screaming at him the entire time. Jeff, move. You can't stand still. Like he was getting on him, bro. And I think it's because well, Luque could grapple. He didn't grapple in that fight, but he could grapple. You don't want to be stuck up against the wall, especially against Rachmanov, because once he gets him down, you're saying he could stuff takedowns, but once he gets him down, can he get back up? And that's the question. And I think that's why Rachmanov is a minus 550 favorite. Can Jeff Neal get back up? I don't think so, Derek. And that's what worries me. And that's why I like Rachmanov. I do think that uh, minus 550 has a lot to do with the hype. This is this is one of the ones you can't get fooled, folks. Jeff Neal is a real deal fighter. And he has a, he has a big shot to get this win. Like you said, Derek, he can catch Rachmanov, especially if the hands start flying mm -hmm. and he's catching him on, like, on, on an entrance and uh, you see a Jeff Neal counter strike. It can happen. Now, can he stop? Can he get back up off the ground? We haven't seen it, and I don't feel comfortable saying yes, man. I feel like Rachmanov has the kind of pressure and the skill and the know-how to keep you down on the ground, and that's probably at least where I'm thinking we're going to see the end of this fight. Bro, he smushed Neil Magny. Like Rachmanov smushed him. Like it made it look like it wasn't <laughs> even like a like an effort. Like and then he smushed him. He had him with like a, a darts choke for a second. Like nah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna beat him up a little bit, and then I'm just gonna choke him the right way. A guillotine. Nah, no big deal, right? I will say this about Jeff Neal, man. He has been taken down recently. Santiago Ponzinibbio, Neil Magny. Uh, he even got taken down by. Uh, Actually, no, that's it. Those are the only takedowns that he's given up besides one takedown against Chase Walden in his UFC debut back in... Uh, actually, it wasn't even debut. It was Dana White Contender Series, but the U first UFC show type situation, right? Hasn't been taken down a lot, but when you get taken down by a Ponzinibbio, and then you compare that to Rachmanov, you're like, ooh, that doesn't feel good. So my whole thing here is that at the end of the day, am I a Rachmanov backer? Absolutely. I think this dude is the truth, the dark horse, real, going to be a real problem at 170. I do think, though, when we're talking about a litmus test... Jeff Neal, that's the guy right there. If you can beat Jeff Neal, all right, we're legitimate, legitimate. And if your takedowns don't work, you have that very traditional, like, Russian boxing style. Very traditional. It's not too much flash, very economical style of fighting. Jeff Neal will exploit that all day long. And the moment you come in, he's countering you. If that left hand catches Rachmanov and Neal was able to clip Luke the way that he was able to, imagine what that's going to do to Rachmanov. We're going to see what happens, but an undefeated fighter against Jeff Neal, lots of hype. I like Neal to play spoiler, but I would not be surprised if he got smushed too. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I like Jeff Neal here, man. And I'm going to I'm gonna take this because I feel like this is money from a baby, stealing money from a baby or candy from a baby, however you want to phrase it, if it hits. Plus 700 TKO for Jeff Neal. Are you kidding me? Give me that all day long. I feel good about that one, man, because if he does win, is that not the path to victory? What do you think? absolute candy from a stroller Derek literally it's right there for the taking yeah Jeff Neal has the opportunity to to rock the world man and if he does if he lands that big left hand we see some shaky legs from Rachmanov you know that that litmus test is a real deal mm -hmm. but me personally Derek I'm taking that plus 250 TKO on the other side man ground and pound finish all day uh give me Shavka Rachmanov and give me round two because Jeff Neal is a real deal so he's gonna get past the first for sure I like that. I like that. And I like round two for myself as well right here. I will say this. The one thing that throws my entire game plan for how this fight goes down out the window is if the grappling of Rachmanov takes away the hands of Neil, which it absolutely can. But you can't always guarantee. This, like, MMA is not that simple. You can't just be like, oh, he's grappler. He's not going to be able to strike against him. I mean, once again, Vicente Luque, right? We were like, oh, he's going to grapple. And then he just didn't. And you're like, oh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how do we move on from here <laughs> all right man with that being said man that's contention right there and we're gonna move on to another contentious fight and another dude who i've been backing man jalen turner starching everybody man i remember when he fought uros medic at ufc 266 i was like bro medic is gonna put it on him and turner got him out of there with the quickness and ever since then man he's submitting dudes he's knocking them out he's just being like yeah i'm 155 pounds but i'm all of 6'3 with a 77 inch reach so aj am i a crazy guy for thinking that i'm gonna let the cat out the bag early but Tausch gamrot and his fantastic grappling fantastic wrestling pedigree i'm talking about an adcc competitor right here can overcome a seven inch reach disadvantage against a dude who hits like a mac truck in jalen turner am i crazy 
No, you're not crazy at all, Derek. When I saw this matchup on the page, my mind instantly went to Gamrot, man. Yeah, because this dude is the real deal. He is a gamer, man, like we were saying before. And even though it's a short notice fight, you know he's in the gym training. You know he's going to be ready. And the style for this one really does favor him, man. It, it, this one uh, is a big one for Matouche, especially because you get to take out a young gun like uh, like Jalen Turner, who has a lot of steam. Now, sure, you just you just came off the L log against uh, Benil Daryush. Yeah, it is what it is. Benny's a dog. It's, mm -hmm. it's a good loss. Now you get to go and beat a uh, up-and-comer who really has a lot of steam against him. It really puts Gamrot's name back in the mix, man. This is a, a dangerous fight, I think, for both guys. Just because of the length that uh, Turner has, the toolboxes he has, and the quirkiness you know because he can pull a lot of things out of nowhere hit you with some weird stuff and next thing you know you're dazed you're looking around you have no idea what's going on i don't know if he's gonna do that to gamera do you see this one do you see the striking of turner causing an issue for gamera right here or because we've seen uh matush fight some of the trickiest fighters out mm -hmm. there man so it's hard to say what do you think yes absolutely jalen turner can hit you from places you cannot get to him at and in order to have an effective shot you have to close distance. You can shoot from outside all day long. Jalen Turner is going to see it coming, and I do believe he has the capacity to sprawl on those attempts. Now here's the tricky part, because Gamrot, we saw it against literally the three best guys you could possibly see it against. Diego Fajeda, fantastic jujitsu. Um, what are we talking about? Armin Sarukian, incredible wrestler. And then Benny Dariush, back to fantastic uh, jujitsu, fantastic grappling overall. We saw that the shot doesn't end after the first attempt for Gamrot. We're going to keep going, and that's going to be the question. Can Jalen Turner not, not just stop shot one, but two, three, four, scramble, you know what I mean? Whatever type of crazy roles he's going to get into, that's where it gets interesting. We have seen Jalen Turner submit people, though, man, and long limbs in jiu-jitsu, and this is not jiu-jitsu, but in jiu-jitsu, long limbs are a, a difficult puzzle to solve, To solve, right? It's just it's harder. You're longer. You're, it's weird. It's like, why is your arm all the way up there? I can't even grab it. I'm trying to get wrist control. I can't even grab your wrist. It's too far up. So we'll see what happens, man. But ultimately, if this is a purely kickboxing fight, J I think Jalen Turner walks away with this, and he makes it look impressive, man. But the same question that I just asked about the last fight, does Gamrot's grappling take away Jalen Turner's ability to sit down on his shots to generate that power. What do you think? Yes and no, Derek, because when you have a when you have a wrestler coming in and you know they're going to be shooting, they're putting all that emphasis, all that momentum going forward and you catch them coming in, you don't need that much power. You just hit them on the button, they go to sleep. Now, that being said, it's hard. <laughs> That's very difficult to do, especially against someone as skilled as, as Gamrot. So can Jalen Turner do it? I think he's going to have to get up off his back four or five, six times. Somewhere in that second, that third round, that's when he's going to see, see a little bit more luck catching uh, Gamrot as he comes in. <clears throat> now, again, massive, massive mound to yeah. do that on. Yeah. That's what worries me most right here because if, if I see this in any other, any other light – Gamrod takes him to the ground and just controls him there, man. And then we see a lot of chain, a lot of uh, chains coming in, puzzles being made, and that's really where this fight is won or lost. I'm hoping the best way to shut down that takedown is mm -hmm. to get Gamrod a little dizzy on his feet and not make him able to get the shoot, get to your hips, able to get going on his game plan. And that's where Jalen Turner, you know, uh, strives. We'll see though, Derek. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a long shot over here, man. And uh, it, and that being said, that is why he is the underdog. Well, I will say Jalen Turner could take Gamrot down, too, because you know what? Uh, shout out to the count. Mike Bisping, the best takedown in the game is a solid left hook to the dome, man, straight to the chin. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I will say this. I'm not a crazy individual, bro. I do recognize that Jalen Turner has a five-inch height advantage and a seven-inch reach advantage. Like in any other circumstance, you'd be like hammer Jalen Turner line all day long. But I do think that this is going to be a very, very difficult contest. Now, um, Props. We need to talk about it. Submission prop plus 260 for Gamrot versus the TKO prop of Turner plus 350. Are we living and dying by Gamrot either submits Turner or gets knocked out and Jalen Turner either knocks out Gamrot or he gets submitted? Are we living and dying by that or is it a little more complicated? 
I think it's a little more complicated. And, and just because Gamrod has multiple ways to win, you can also see that plus 200 decision right there. I think the longer the fight goes, the more this starts to benefit uh, Gamrod. If Jalen Turner can stuff him up real quick, hurt him early, get the fight done, get a knockout, go out on his way, plus 350, glide out all night. But that being said, it's really hard to do against the game. And I do think this one goes a little longer and then we start to see the mix-up. This is another litmus test that I think not a lot of people are actually considering a litmus test just because Jalen Turner has been proven before. But this one, man, this one's going to see who in about three, four, five years is going to be the champion around, man. Or at that's least right. knocking on the door. Yeah, no, that's right. And I, I like your mindset here because I, I do truly think that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, listen, man. Jalen, I mean, Jalen Turner got a couple different ways to win. Gamrod got a couple different ways. It's going to be a lot more complicated than just, it's, you know, as simple as that. But, all right, man, um, let's talk about it then. I like Mataj Gamrod, and I think he gets the job done. I think that his pace is going to be an issue for Turner because that's the thing. The earlier the fight goes, Turner, I think he wins. The later the fight goes, I think Gamrod, man, you saw what he's able to do over the course of five rounds against a couple different really fantastic guys. Jalen Turner, all right, brother, you okay? I'm getting a little red Ooh. over there. All right. Just Cough sure. once. All right, no worries. Got a cough again. Get yourself, get yourself together, man. <laughs> All right, folks, listen. When it comes down to these very contentious type of battles right here, yes, Gamrod is a minus 200 favorite. This is going to be one of those weird situations where even though we're going back and forth and we're having our difficulties on it, I still think hedging this fight might be your best bet right here. If you got a couple dollars to throw down on Jalen Turner, I would throw down a couple dollars, man, because I honestly do not think that this is as simple as Gamrod steamrolls him, especially on short notice, especially against a guy with the tools and the frame of Jalen Turner, who very much does enjoy some of the perks that John Jones has in his career he's just longer and taller than everybody man it makes it a little easier so uh the final count man give me or actually what you got brother what you got before we get yeah. the count yeah yeah no i was saying to say man um well one thank you for taking over on that one of course i was just gonna give a pick was that what you were leading up to bro? So that was it that was it but go ahead give me your pick yeah, yeah, who you yeah, got yeah, there we go. i'm taking Jalen turner plus 350 with that tko i'm Jeez. actually going round one man i don't know if gamrot yeah, I think he's in the gym. We think all this. We think he's ready. I will see on that short notice if he chooses to push the pace a little bit. I'm thinking he's going to catch him on coming in on a takedown round one. Jalen Turner TKO. <sighs> Jiu-jitsu for the win, baby. Give me the submission. Mataj Gamrot wraps up that long ass neck of Jalen Turner and chokes him out, or you know, grabs his long ass arm and he kimuras him or something. Man, who's to say? Look at what he did to Jeremy Stevens, man. Jeremy Stevens tried to kimura him and he said, "No, no, no. Give me your shoulder. I'm snatching it off the goddamn bone." All love to Jalen Turner, though, man. Legitimate. I'm rooting for this guy, but it's tough when you get a matchup like this one where just two. Once again, an indomitable, fo an indomitable force versus the movable object. I guess if that's what you want to call it. All right, man. I don't know how much we're going to have to say about this one, but let's talk about it. Bo Nickel, Jamie Pickett. I mean, the odds. <laughs> you saw it. I mean, come on, bro. Like, we have to just sit here and laugh at this a little bit. Minus 1,400 at open. Currently, minus 1,600 um, favorite is Bo Nickel. Again, to Jamie Pickett, man. They're not showing Jamie Pickett any love. And I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, man. If he could catch Bo Nickel on the way in, we might see an upset of a lifetime. But if you don't, I don't think he gets up after Nickel takes him down. What do you think? I don't think so either, Derek. You're talking about the cream of the crop. Somebody who was able to go into, you know, the lion's den, literally the the, the craziest jujitsu, the best jujitsu, Gordon Ryan. Bo Nickel said, yeah, I'll, I'll fight him at his own game. Sure, you know, he did lose, but still. The fact he's able to go in there with the cream of the cream of the crop huh? and get it done, man. I don't think Jamie Pickett has anything to answer for him on the ground. Now, that being said, could he catch him in? Could the uppercuts work? Could the knees work? Anything can happen in the fight. So if you got a little bit of cash, you're looking to, looking to spend, man. Plus 800 isn't too bad. And it's I just looked, it's grown to plus 1100 out there. It's not the worst. It's not the worst, man. It can happen. But this is another one where it's almost like, yeah, everybody's picking bow. I'm not touching the Jamie Pickett line whatsoever. I'm not touching the Bo Nickel line. You don't touch this. You just sit here and you enjoy the Bo Nickel performance that he's about to put on. Listen, D1 wrestler, um, outstanding, just like cream of the crop wrestler who has some hands too, but should not use them here against a Jamie Pickett. He should get out of there. 
if he can get it done in the first round, get it done, walk away, and then move on to the next uh, the next battle right here. But that uh, that fight you're talking about when he was uh, doing some jujitsu with uh, Gordon Ryan, Bonick was a white belt then, man, in jujitsu, and he was just suplexing Gordon Ryan all day long. So uh, if he could do a little bit of the same, man, I just envision this, the same as the Dana White Contender Series fights, man. You get close, you start fainting a couple shots, you take him down, you take his back, and you choke him, and it's simple, and you don't take more damage than you need to. Give me Bo Nickel. Um, the question here, though, minus 205 for the submission. Bo Nickel said it himself. He's like, I'm either submitting him or I'm knocking him out. Obviously, you're going to say that because you want to be confident, but the question <laughs> really becomes like minus 205 for the submission when you can club and sub your way that way. Like you can club and sub to a submission or you can just club and you can just ground and pound TKO. Who's to say he can't do it that way? What do you think? Man, I mean, the the submission makes the most sense, especially because, you know, you know that Jamie Pickett will be putting up a defense. I don't know, man. I mean, I'm, I'm looking to gamble a little bit right here. That plus 275, give me that TKO all day long. Although round one, it's hard to get go against it, man. What do you think? It's tough. I see the submission because it's the easiest path to victory. But that, I mean, the TKO is right. Give me the TKO, man. Just give me the TKO. What are we talking about? Like... First round, TKO, and just like that, AJ, I'm really hoping that we're not going to eat our words here because we have both successfully predicted a UFC 285 main card with five finishes, all finishes all across the board. Last time we did that, didn't work out very well. Folks who are listening and watching to this program right now, if you are fans of this show, you know that we're right much more often than we're wrong. But sometimes we are wrong. So take it into consideration. But this is why this is your favorite fighter's favorite fight show. This is why we gave you the picks. And this is why. AJ, you want to know something? I'm going to pull this up. Sneak peek for the for the people who are uh, actually tuning into this. I'll, I'll read it off for the people who are uh, just listening too. But I decided, I was like, I want to take a different uh, trajectory in terms of like our thought process of like what our picks are looking like. We tell you what we're all. We're at 60% year in and year out. But if we're looking at it, right, we're talking about lifetime. We're talking about as it stands right now, folks. I'm sorry that this is a little uh, a little weird. There we go. Boom. All right, look at that. Lifetime record for me and AJ, right? Three on three and 192 for me, 277, 218 for my man AJ. Obviously that first year we did, AJ, you came in a little bit rough. You picked it up tremendously since then. But the point is we're talking about over the course. I actually tallied it up. It's 495 total fights is uh, over the course, right? And we both have over a 50 five percent accuracy so we're not just talking simply to talk we're talking because look at the numbers it backs it up you dig what time it is aj any comments on that the uh, the one big comment i have for that Derek. yeah you said lifetime span folks but if you're looking at the growth pattern that was a 10 percent growth i'm pretty sure by both of us it might have been a little bit oh, one is higher than i forget exactly what the number mm -hmm. it was but not only that folks we're shooting for a 69 percent accuracy have it on the accountability board right That's here right. man every day you gotta look at it so if you're rolling with us folks you're gonna see not only numbers increase in pocketbooks increase in viewers increase and in all that stuff but also you're gonna have a lot more fun when you're watching this show knowing that it's coming right from your favorite fighter's favorite fight show that's right and just to give the correct statistics you my friend from 2021 to 2022 you had 11 percent increase in terms of your accuracy for me i had a six percent increase right so i went from 58 to 64 you went from 50 to 61 now like you said 69 that's the low mark we're hitting 70 over here baby let's go all right with that being said folks we're running out of time so we're gonna hit some for some fight night. If you ain't paying attention, are you gonna sleep on me or I'm gonna wake you up? All right, AJ, because of time restrictions, because this is a fantastic card, and I do want to talk about a couple of these prelims, we're going to have to do this the most expeditiously we've ever done sleepers. Folks, this entire card is a sleeper. I don't care what fight you tune into, it's going to be a sleeper. With that being said, all I'm going to do very briefly, apologies, is I'm going to bring this up, and I'm going to tell you about a fight that I am very interested in. It's this one right here. We're talking about Mana Martinez versus Cameron Simon.
Same man, the South African, the dude who got away with the illegal knee, but still won the fight in his last <laughs> one, brother. Listen, man, this is going to be a very fun fight. Stand up affair. We could see a little bit of grappling go in here, but Mana Martinez, who was coming off of the back of that controversy for James Krause, I think he's looking to develop into his own character. Do not be surprised if somebody goes to sleep here, but you're going to see some phenomenal striking. You're going to see some very wacky techniques here. And at the end of the day, man, I do think that you're going to see them put it on the line because Cameron Saiman, Saiman, man is 7-0, and oh, undefeated. Not trying to give up that oh must watch TV right here. AJ, with that being said, I don't even need you to comment. Let's just jump straight into yours, my friend. And uh let me just pull it up first so you have the opportunity to talk about it. Boom, you got a fun one, brother. Talk about it. This is a fun one, Derek. I'm picking this one specifically. The Basharat versus Blackshear fight specifically, because this is proving ground, man. We get to see the other Bash Bro go at it. Another, what is he, nine and no record versus somebody who has a, uh, you know, he has a UFC record. He did the draw when he came in, but it, it's against Yusuf Zalal. So, yes, this is a real deal fighter in Blackshear, and he can put up a serious, serious problem for the Basharat, bro. But, this is the hype reel, man. You can see on Tapology, everybody's looking 92% going for the Basharat. But we'll see, man. I mean, this is this is either going to be somebody making another smash spot, Bash Bros coming in and wrecking, or Blackshear making a, a hell of a night for himself and making a lot of fans upset and sad. Either way, I'm going to be happy watching this one. I'm excited to see how the Bash Bro comes in again, man. Just finishing off how his brother did, what was it, two weeks ago? Yeah. It's going to be some momentum coming, man. We'll see. That's right, brother. That's right. And folks, like I said, the whole card's a sleeper, but go ahead. You can enjoy those two that we just showed you. And due to the sake of time, we got just a couple more minutes. Let's talk about a couple of prelims here, brother. So, my man, let me uh, do some backing out and all that fun stuff. And uh, all right, man, let's talk about the first one. Cody, uh, no love Garbrand makes his return back to 135 against... A dude who's just a, he's an underrated guy, man, has a lot more success than he does in. But we're talking about Trevin Five Star Jones against No Love Cody Garbrandt. What do you think, man? Can Cody Garbrandt really make that ascent, make that a surgence? Because if we're looking at it, and I'm going to pull it back up again so we can see, uh, Cody Garbrandt, man, it has not been looking good in his last five or so. He is one and four. And that only win, that a Sun South knockout, man, that was, you got to, I mean, he prayed to the, the heavens above, man. That was a, hand that was a lisa simpson you know what i'm saying like one of those <laughs> meme joints what do you think about this one man trevin jones is coming off a couple losses himself what do you think this is a good fight for both fighters right here and when cody garbrandt is on he is looking great man he is he's moving he's flowing man prime cody garbrandt when he's in that wide boxing stance and he's being the aggressor he's hard to deal with trevin five star jones has had a little bit of a rough streak but <clears throat> a lot more well-rounded of a fighter. I feel like this is this is 100% Garbrandt's time to get back in the driver's seat, and this is Jones' chance to steal the wheel. We'll see, Derek. I'm, I'm actually favoring Jones, but you can't. It's hard to bet against Garbrandt in that big right hand, man. It is, it is so hard, man. And then going back up to 135, you're hoping life is in order now. Maybe we can have a little bit of a better performance. You're right. It's tough, man. And I, I can't bet on anybody because I don't want to be disappointed again. I'll just say that, man. <laughs> All right, bro. This one, my man said he was done. He was all like, bro, I'm I, title shots over, but he's back. Blonde Brunson is back with a vengeance, man. And he's fighting a scary dude. And Drikas Duplessis said he's the real, he's going to be the real only African champion when he gets the belt one day. He says, I breathe African air every day, bro. Let's go. But then again, you got Blonde Brunson, man, who makes all of these dudes who talk a big talk look foolish. So what you think? Can Brunson get another one on the board? Or is Duplessis, is he just ascending too much right now? I have stopped disrespecting Blonde Brunson, right. Derek. Give me Brunson for a hump fest for the win. That's I'm right. joking. <laughs> but seriously, though, you give me Brunson for a win. Yeah. I do like him as a wrestling in this one. Uh, Drikas Duplessis does have a lot to offer. The striking is mm -hmm. going to be hard to deal with, but Brunson has seen it all. That's right. That's right. The power of Duplessis is going to be interesting, but Derek Brunson has fought the cream of the crop. And uh, we have seen if you, if Duplessis, if he does another one of those lat drops and, you know, lets his opponent fall on top of him, which I've done many times in jujitsu, it's not fun. Uh, Brunson ain't letting him up. You know that's going down. All right, bro. Viviani Araujo versus Amanda Hebos, man. So Amanda Hebos says, you know what? Let me take another shot back here at 125. We're going to disregard 115 for now, uh, which is interesting. I'm not really quite sure if she's just trying to make this move to both divisions or if she sees it to be more lucrative at 125 but this is a tough fight bro this is very very tough and i could see this being very close who are you leaning towards in this one 
I'm leaning towards Araujo, man, and I'm a, it hurts to say because I'm a huge Hibas fan and I want Hibas to win, <clears throat> but with the size of Araujo and with yeah. the style, makes it very, very difficult for Hibas, man. Yeah. I think so, too. I think Hibas' most valuable trait is her jiu-jitsu, but we're going to have to see which can you do with the hands because I think Araujo can mitigate a lot of that jiu-jitsu. Um, this will be a fun one. This will be a fun one. But if that Marina Rodriguez fight was indicative of anything, man, you crack Hiba. That was at 115. We're at 125, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just saying. This will be a fun fight, though. All right, man. This is one that I, I figure if anybody... I'm surprised you didn't pick it as a, as a sleeper, but I think it's because it's that big of a fight. The Cuban Missile Crisis, Julian Marquez, fighting the power bar, Mark andre Berriolt, bro. I mean, this is either going to last less than a round or this is going to be the craziest three rounds you've seen in your life. What do you think? I think this is going to be gas pedal to the metal, Derek. We're going to see the Cuban Missile Crisis versus Power Bar just draining the gas tank. I'm expecting a round one finish. I don't know for who. That's right. All right, man. And then last couple ones right here. I think this is going to be a fun one just because I think this is a stylistically – this is going to be a, a good a good matchup for Baby Shark right here. Tabitha Ricci gets Jessica Penne. Um, Penne hasn't been in the greatest form as of late. Um, she's just like, listen, man, unabashed, right? I'm saying this in as a critique. And who am I to critique anything? These are professionals. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about compared to these guys. But her last loss against Emily Ducate, she just got pieced up. You know what I mean? She got leg kicked and pieced up for three rounds. Baby Shark isn't going to do that. She's going to work her jiu-jitsu and her wrestling, right? But her wins, right? Carolina Ko uh, uh, Kovalkiewicz, right? Got the armbar win. All right, right. Right on, right on. Lu uh, Lupi Godinez, split decision win. Close one right there. Last couple losses. Daniel Taylor, of course, Jessica Andrade and stuff like that. But Ricci, man, the only loss that she had is a fight she took in a, in a weight class that wasn't her own mm -hmm. to the beast, Manon Furo, who is now, what, number one in her, in her division? So I think Baby Shark, man, she's going to go to the well with the decisions. If you're going to sit here and strike with her, look at what she did to Pollyanna Viana, Maria Oliveira, big fan of Maria Oliveira. Let's go. Um, so realistically, man, Jessica Penne, sick jujitsu, man. She has a path to victory here. I just think Baby Shark is going to put too much pressure on her. What do you think? I uh, give me Baby Shark with the pressure all day long, Derek. This is a fight made for Tabitha. This is one of the fights we're going to look back at Tabitha Richie's career three, four, five, six years down the road. And this is the one that puts her on the mat, man. I think she's going to solidify herself in that top 10. Yeah. I guess we'll see, though, man. Give me a Richie. I'm excited for this one, too. And Penny is still a name. She's still a name, legitimately, right? And with that being said, man, I think that's just about everything. Ian Machado Gary, Keenan Song, Song Kanan, whatever you want to call it. But uh, a lot of people predict him. Ian Gary, man, 10-0, first round finish. They're saying smash that play. I mean, I haven't seen Song fight in a little minute, man, but I do know Gary is the truth. What do you think? Gary's the real deal, man. I don't know about smashing tickets right away, but give me Gary as a, as a definitely a favorite here for sure. All right. Well, folks, UFC 285. Wasn't that fun? I thought that was fun. All right, man. Listen, you know where to find us. TikTok, Bloody Water Podcast, AJ's Twitch, twitch.tv slash Santa Fe Bomber. If you don't go to Twitch right now, download that the app, subscribe, follow, whatever the, the functions are to do so to get my man over. Where do we need to hit? What's the number, AJ? Woo, 13 more followers, That's Derek. Right. That's what we need to get to 50. So that way we can start affiliating again, some <coughs> better stream quality, yeah. some more things coming your way. Folks, this is going to be releasing on Friday. So if you're watching this one, you're looking for something to do, your boy is live right now. Go over there. We're breaking down fights. If not, we're playing some games. Either way, we're talking shit and having a whole lot of fun. So make sure you go down there, hit the button and subscribe. And if you got kids, folks, make sure they're not watching the stream. But if you tell them that you know a streamer, they look how look how happy they'll be. So at least that way you get a little bit of cool points from your kids. So make sure you're following and subscribed. And you're going to be helping a great cause, right? Every subscriber that we get is going to lower the cough of amount of aj does on the show by like one cough every single episode like we're gonna get it down you know what i'm saying <laughs> but hey it's an incentive so do it but listen youtube.com slash freethinkers club bloody water podcast 514 subscribers as we're recording right now i need it to 520 by this upcoming week i'm not saying you have to but i'd like it if you did i'm putting in this work go ahead come on reciprocate you know what time it is aj uh what do you got for the people before we hop up out of here Folks, I am saying you have to. Go ahead right now, hit that button, share it with your friends, make sure. And why I'm saying you have to is because we're winning you money. And if you're leaving money on the table, you make us feel bad. So make sure you're hitting that subscribe button, share it with your friends. Go ahead. Let's get it going. This can be a fun card, man. So fun that there's there's literally people in the extended friend group that are wanting to get together for this. This is what a John Jones fight week does. This is what a bullet fight week does. Either way, it's good to see sports back at the front of the TV, man. 
that's right. It feels almost McGregor esque, right? Where people start, hey, so so what you think about that that Jones fight? And I'd be like, you don't know shit about what you thought. What are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? But I will say this, man. Once again, I'm gonna go back to my favorite quote that there is: uh, teach a man, or actually give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man how to fish, and he'll eat for a lifetime. That is what AJ is providing for you at twitchtv bomber. So we want to teach you the goods. We don't want to just give you the goods. Don't be dependent on us. Go make your own money. Um, but you'll see. Easier said than done. All right, folks. That is it for us. And uh, catch us on Monday for the post show. Will John Jones get the strap? Will Gon get it? I don't know. We'll find out. But that's it for us. Until next time. Peace.